Welcome everybody to this wonderful book launch event. I am uh, Marty Finnamore. I'm a member of the Elliott School faculty and also of the political science department here at GW. Um, I, I am very proud to say that I chaired the hiring committee for our lovely speaker today. Um, so we are here today to help our uh, colleague, our professor, our friend Jeff Ding launched his new book, Technology and the Rise of Great Powers, just out from Princeton University Press. You too can order your copy. Um, many of you uh, know Jeff, but for those of you who don't, Jeff came to GW from Oxford U University where he was a Rhodes Scholar and did his PhD. He then did a postdoc CSAC at Stanford University uh, before coming here to GW. Um, he's been a terrific asset to GW since he's been here for at least three reasons. I'm sure some of you can add to this list. Uh, one, he's from Iowa. <laughs> Go Caitlin Clark. Go Hawkeyes. The Iowa contingent is cheering here. We, the, uh, the school is better for more <laughs> Iowans in it. Um, Second, he is teaching uh, classes that interest, I think, a lot of our students. He's teaching classes on China, on AI, on China and AI, uh, and on US foreign policy making, all of which are topics of interest to Elliott School students. Um, but his academic interests actually overlap with his teaching interests, which is not always true for some of us here. Um, and um, he is, uh, his new book deals with um, not just China, not just the AI, but the larger problem of how big technological innovations change the configuration of world power on the planet, uh, you know, the rise of great powers. Uh, it's an interesting chair. I used to work on the Hill before I became an academic, trying to talk to members of Congress about science and technology policy. These are really hard conversations. Your average member of Congress does not care about science and technology. Um, so anything we can do to improve those conversations and make us all smarter about it is all to the good. Um, we are hopeful that after Jeff uh, gives his presentation, we will have comments by Richard Denley, former <coughs> Secretary of the Navy. Um, fingers crossed about that. But in the meantime, since Jeff can say many more intelligent things about his book than I can, I'm going to turn it over to Professor Jeffrey Ding. Thank you, Marty, for that generous introduction. Um, yeah, I was getting nervous about doing this last night, and I reminded myself that I gave a version of this talk before you and the hiring committee and the GW faculty. Um, and so if I mess up here, it's not that big of a deal. I'm glad I didn't mess up there and still got uh, hired. So I'm really grateful to the department, to all the different institutes at the Elliott School that I'm a part of. I think I, I remember when doing the planning for a book workshop my first fall here, uh, Alex Downs and Charlie Glazer, who are uh, at the Institute of Security and Conflict Studies, they were hosting a book workshop. And I was going to invite almost everyone in the IR faculty uh, and they said, you actually can't invite that many people because everyone will say yes. And I think Marty is an example of sort of, you know, leading scholar of political science and international relations being willing to say yes and help um, everybody. So I'm really appreciative for the collegial environment here. I want to especially thank Christine Gilbert for organizing this event um, and really doing all the behind the scenes to make it work. We actually went past like the Eventbrite limit of 250 registrations. So it was like a, a big um, task to sort of handle everything. So really appreciative to her and also Joy Ark. Okay, we don't know if Danzig will be here or not. So we'll leave that uh, air of mystery lingering over the presentation. Uh, but if he doesn't make it, we will just have more, times for, uh, more time for Q&A. So let's dig into it. So my book tackles, I think, two of the biggest trends that we confront today. Number one is a geopolitical trend, which is the rise of China, return of great power competition between the US and China, conversations about a new tech Cold War. 
Second trend is a technological one, which is the rise of artificial intelligence, which some view as the driver of the fourth industrial revolution. And where those intersect is US-China competition over AI and this idea of an AI arms race, a new Cold War, a new tech Cold War. And what I find interesting about this image is it captures this sort of geopolitical competition between US and China over technology. Uh, but I think anyone who's watched The Queen's Gambit or got really into chess during the pandemic, which was myself included, would know that this is not something that would ever occur on a chessboard. Uh, the kings would never touch each other. And I think it's a nice illustration of the confusion we have about what great power competition and technology actually looks like. And it's an image uh, that's a bit confused. There's no baseline framework for how to think about how emerging technologies will affect US-China competition. One starting point, uh, which is actually where the book begins in the introduction chapter, is this speech by Chinese leader Xi Jinping. He goes to, a, to the summit of the BRICS nations in 2018. BRICS are Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. They make up a huge portion of the global economic output and population seen as a group of rising powers. And the summit theme is development in the fourth industrial revolution. So in his speech to this summit, he specifically references these past industrial revolutions and links them to how rounds of disruptive technological innovation has shaped the trajectory of human development. The Study Times is an authoritative Communist Party publication that, that publishes commentaries on uh, Chinese leader Xi Jinping's speeches. And so after the summit, they go back and unpack and try to analyze this speech. And they analyze it very much in geopolitical terms. Referring to those three past industrial revolutions, Britain seized the opportunity of the first industrial revolution and became the productivity leader, right? There's that connection between these industrial revolutions and becoming the number one economic power, becoming the global hegemon by seizing the mantle of advanced productivity leadership. And it's not just Chinese leaders and policymakers in the US, the Biden administration, there's this connection between emerging technologies and the balance of power. There's also this connection in, <laughs> glad you made it. I will introduce, I will introduce you after. I finish up my remote. No, you're good. Um, so it's also reflected in the pattern uh, patterns described by historians and international relations scholars, such as prominent historian Paul Kennedy. And he specifically lays out this connection between the rise and fall of great powers, where there's a process. You have technological change that leads to shifts in the global economic balances that eventually shapes the political and military balances. And today for my talk and for my book, I'm only focusing on this first step in the chain. How do these technological revolutions affect the rise and fall of economic leadership, specifically with a focus on productivity because productivity is what sustains long-term economic growth differentials. The conventional view of this is what I call leading sector theory. And it's this idea that one country is gonna dominate key technologies in these new fast growing sectors. They're gonna get all these monopoly profits from these new industries. And eventually they're gonna reinvest those profits and become the world's most productive economy. So you see Kennedy's name again, but you also have other classic texts in international relations such as uh, Gilpin's work as well. Dan Dresner summarizes this view of leading sector theory with this one sentence summary, a great power has acquired hegemon status through a near monopoly on innovation in leading sectors. This resonates very much in policymaking circles where we live and work. It's about controlling technological innovation 
preventing these crown jewels from leaking to other countries and making sure that we continue to be the first to innovate and bring new to the world innovations out. It's built on literature from economists and economic historians that identify this classic sequence of great leading sectors. Uh, these past industries that grew really fast off the back of new innovations and they became key export sectors. Think cotton textiles in the first industrial revolution with the spinning jenny innovation that made it easier to mechanize weaving. And it's not just cotton textiles. There's been explosive growth in the steel industry, chemicals, automobile industry. These are all identified in this classic sequence of great leading sectors. In this book, I argue for a different explanation based off of general purpose technologies and a focus on the diffusion process, the adoption of these innovations across a wide range of productive processes. And general purpose technologies are special. They've been identified by economic historians as engines of growth because they often precede huge waves of productivity growth. But the way in which they impact shifts uh, in the long-term economic growth differentials between great powers is very different from the leading sector account. It's based off of these foundational advances that have this scope for continual improvement. They're often attached to this entire research paradigm. Uh, they only make an impact after they diffuse across all these different sectors in the economy. When you think about the impact of AI, it's not going to just come from one industry. Uh, it's gonna come from the impact on economic growth and productivity comes from the accumulated distribution of how AI will shape essentially all industries of the economy. And crucially, they only make their impact if there's complementary innovation in all these other sectors because they demand sort of a restructuring of the economy. Electricity only makes its mark after factories have to completely change their layout from the central steam engine directing a central system of shafts and belts to power machines to this more decentralized layout. Uh, where electricity can power individual machines. And that, that, that takes time, that takes complementary innovations such as organizational changes as well. That's a pathway that's very different from who can capture monopoly profits in a brief window of time for a new fast growing industry. And I argue in this book, that's going to shape the institutional adaptations that countries uh, have to undertake to adapt to technological revolutions. And I focus in this book on skill formation institutions, the education and training institutions that widen the base of engineering skills associated with the general purpose technology. So I gave you the brief overview of where I'm going. Next, we'll get into the argument a little bit more and draw out the theory. I'll present a little bit of the evidence specifically uh, the second industrial revolution chapter uh, and some summaries of the other historical case studies. And then we'll conclude with the implications for US-China competition in AI. The key question we're trying to explore is how do technological revolutions affect the rise and fall of great powers? And the basis for the argument is new technologies present this gap and countries are trying to figure out what is the right puzzle piece to fill that gap, right? What is the set of domestic institutions, set of policies, uh, how a country does industrial organization, what type of patent protections, is it a decentralized approach to science and technology development? And most specifically for my purposes, how does a country train talent to catch up to these emerging technologies? When we are mapping out the puzzle of technological revolutions and the rise of all great powers, we oftentimes fixate on the most dramatic aspects of technological change. The aspects that make the front page of the Wall Street Journal or MIT Tech Review, that moment, that initial eureka moment, the initial innovation, chat, open AI debuts, chat GPT. And so 
when we try to explain how technological change and power transitions interact, we focus on does the rising power have those institutional ingredients to corner and control profits in these new fast growing leading sectors. So these ideas, even wrong ideas, they, they, they have a basis, right? They don't come from nowhere. I think what a lot of previous scholarship and uh, thinking on this subject did is they took this idea of the product cycle, which is how we conceptualize the stages of a company developing a new product innovation and when they can capture those benefits. And they basically just applied it to the rise and fall of national economies. So note the parallels to this and the leading sector story. The innovating firm comes up with this new product innovation, the iPhone or whatever new product innovation comes to mind. They have that brief window created by when they had that initial head start on research and development where they get monopoly profits because no one else has that product. Eventually over time, you have all these other competitors, other people start making competitor smartphones and you lose that, that window where that product was, um, that that product was helping your firm uh, gain this sort of monopoly profit advantage. So you have to come up with the next generation of product innovation. So here, this idea that the most important major innovations are only gonna cluster in one country at one particular period of time. Uh, other scholars emphasize the greatest impact on economic growth differentials comes very early in the leading sector's development, right? You wanna capture that brief window for monopoly profits. And then over time, we don't care too much about the diffusion and imitation process because now that process of in just that process of these new inventions becoming fairly routine and widespread components of the economy, that's not that important because that's when all the competitor countries take over. Uh, whereas my theory, GPT diffusion, it's that very process by which general purpose technologies become fairly routine and widespread components of the economy. That's the most salient for my purposes. So I've gone over a preview of GPTs in earlier slides. I won't repeat this, but it's coming from a literature that identifies these three key characteristics of GPTs. Uh, there are these engines of productivity growth. And the crucial thing to take away is general purpose technologies throughout history, they follow this regular pattern by which they impact productivity growth. It's this extended, protracted period of incremental technical improvements it takes a long time. It took five decades from the initial debut of the electric dynamo, which was the first practical industrial generator, until the US, which was the first adopting country to get huge productivity benefits from electricity. And this gradual protracted trajectory only makes a mark after there's other streams of technological innovation, right? AI is not going to impact productivity growth until there's complementary innovations in computing centers, complementary uh, co collection of data sets for every particular industry to, to fine tune models. It has, it's not just the AI industry that's the one locus of innovation when it comes to GPTs at least. It's a very different story if we're talking like pharmaceutical industry, right? You, you might not, it's not going to impact the overall economy through this type of process. Second key point is diffusion. These are just the two parts of the theory, GPT diffusion theory, why diff GPTs, why diffusion? Well, <clears throat> because these general purpose technologies, they only make their mark through diffusion. Uh, it doesn't, uh, doesn't matter if just one industry adopts AI or electricity. Uh, you have to diffuse it throughout the entire economy. And of course, being the first to innovate, having some leading edge firms and universities is going to be important. It's often having a strong innovation capacity is gonna sometimes correlate with strong adoption. But I think the key point here is it's not determinative. We have to separate out those processes. Uh, there's all these other factors that will affect diffusion such as communication networks, sometimes actually being first uh, 
is harmful, right? There's this whole theory about latecomer advantage. You don't have these legacy institutions, so you can adopt things quicker. Uh, and at least for my book, the skill infrastructure is the most important factor. And so, and especially when you're talking about advanced economies, rising powers, great powers that are competing for technological leadership, all of these countries are gonna have some frontier firms and universities that are at the technological frontier. It's more of a, we're not gonna, China, for example, in AI, China has some of the top institutions in AI when it comes to universities and companies. It's more about can those firms transit, can, can those countries do better at imitation, right? It's a little bit counterintuitive, but imitation, especially among these advanced economies might be more important than innovation. So why do I focus on what I call GPT skill infrastructure, these training education institutions that widen the pool of engineering talent? Well, the emergence of new GPTs creates these two demands. One is consistent with all new technologies. All new technologies, there's going to be a little bit of a skills mismatch, right? The talent is always racing to keep up with the technology. But especially for GPTs, you need to coordinate between the sector that's initiating the general purpose technology and all these other application sectors. And uh, because, uh, for example, like when electricity was being developed, there's all these different standards, right? Direct current, alternating current. If you're an application sector trying to figure out, okay, how do I shift my organizational layout? How do I shift my technologies to match with the GPT? You want to have a good sense of what's happening in that sector that, that's making those changes, making those shifts between different standards of electrical currents. And so the reason I focus on engineering talent is it solves both of these issues, right? Having this new, having this strong engineering discipline that's training a wide body of engineers to implement GPT in, in all these different sectors and then this also systematizes and standardizes the best practices the, 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 and the knowledge base that's required to make sure the application sector can coordinate with the GPT sector. So I threw a lot at you right there, but this is the takeaway slide in terms of GPT diffusion theory versus the conventional explanation that I'm arguing against. The first three columns identify how the technological trajectories are different. Leading sector, it's all about that brief window, lops, the, the impact on economic growth differentials is lopsided in the early stages. It's about which country can monopolize innovation. And the breadth of growth, the breadth of technological change is all concentrated in a few sectors. GPT diffusion, different predictions, essentially diverging predictions on all of those different dimensions. Right? Actually, the impact time frame comes in those later stages. It's about edge and diffusion, not innovation. Uh, and it's about, and, and the breadth of growth, the breadth of technological change is much more dispersed throughout the entire economy. And that then maps onto differences in the institutional adaptations countries have to make. So with the focus on skill formation institutions, it's not about deepening the skill base, training the best and the brightest AI talent, for example, it's more about widening the skill base, uh, cultivating this engineering discipline uh, that can that can spread <laughs> GPTs across the entire. Area. So let me walk you through how I test these mechanisms in the second industrial revolution case. Here we have both a technological revolution. Uh, so th this is 1870 to 1914. Some scholars see this as one of the densest, one of the densest periods of scientific breakthroughs. You have all these new things coming about, the electric dynamo, indigo dyes, these synthetic dyes that create this whole new industry around chemicals. The internal combustion engine comes out around this time. The universal milling machine allows you to shape metal and wood in more precise ways. Uh, and that means that you can create interchangeable parts for, for making all these different instruments and devices. So there's a technological revolution and there's an economic power transition. This is the period where uh, 
you have the relative rise of Germany and the U.S. and the relative decline of Britain. Uh, so David Landis calls it a shift from essentially a one nation to a multi-nation industrial system. So we're trying to map how did we get from here to there? How did we get from the technological revolution to the economic power transition? Did it go according to the leading sector pathway or did it go according to the GPT diffusion pathway? And this is a substantively important case too. It's a key reference point for president discussions. Whenever you hear the term AI is the new electricity, it's calling back to this period of time. And a lot of one key note on sources, a lot of this is secondary research building on the great work of historians of technology, economic historians, uh, who have revised the dominant narratives of past, uh, past literature, which uh, sort of te tended to overlook this diffusion process. So a little background on the outcome we're trying to explain. Key thing I want you to notice here on all these different productivity and economic efficiency indicators, it's the US that becomes the leading economic power in this period. Oftentimes I think we focus on Germany because it's the precursor to World War I and you had conflict between Germany and the UK. But I think what's really important to see here is that Germany never overtakes Britain when it comes to economic efficiency. Again, the focus on productivity is drawing on a lot of other scholars, works, such as Mike Beckley, who's established that economic efficiency is really important when we're talking about measuring the power of nations. So we want to explain the U.S. case. Well, how did technological revolutions allow the U.S. to become the clear uh, preeminent economic power? And I'm going through all those different dimensions, right? The impact time frame, the phase of technological change that might matters, innovation versus diffusion, the breadth of growth, and then we'll get to the skill infrastructure. On the timelines phase, sure, Germany does dominate chemical production in this time period. It's a sexy, new, fast-growing industry. They have the strongest industrial R&D labs, new mode of innovation. They control all of this global dye step production by the end of the period that we're talking about. But it's very difficult to make the case that this new leading sector, this monopoly on innovation, was crucial to the US's economic advantage. They were very late to establish industrial research labs compared to Germany, and there were only seven American dye makers in 1914. Uh, there's a similar story with electrification. Uh, so there's some qualitative accounts here. There's also a quantitative account from Sergio Petralia where he looked at when did uh, electricity actually have a significant impact on productivity growth. Only comes after 1914. There was this very gradual transition from that central steam powered system of sh uh, shafts and belts that I mentioned to what was called electric unit drive, electricity powering individual machines. And so the book traces through a similar story for the internal combustion engine in the automobile industry. All these leading sectors, all these new industries really did not make their mark before the US became the economic superpower. So what was the thing that matched well with the time frame that we're talking about? Actually, it was these this general purpose technology surrounding machine tools and the system of interchangeable manufacture. I mentioned the milling machine. There's also the turret lathe in 1845. You had all these earlier innovations that by the 1880s, 1890s had started to proliferate and diffuse across American industry in torrential proportions. So this system, right, of machine tools creating these precise interchangeable parts that spread across making bicycles, sewing machines, all types of manufacturing industries, that actually became known as the American system of manufacturing. The other thing that does match up with this time frame is the steel industry, and that does lend some credence to the leading sector story, right? Both U.S. and Germany far outpaced Britain in terms of steel output and exports, and maybe that's how they translated these monopoly profits into industrial advantage. So we'll keep that in mind. When it came to the phase of technological change that was the most important, that was the deciding factor, the US is not monopolizing innovations in leading sectors at this time period. This is data from a list of innovations collected by Van Duen. 
Uh, the U.S. is not an export-centric economy at this time period. I think this quote from the British Institute of Electrical Engineers is pretty, uh, is pretty illustrative in terms of, look, all of the, the other U.S. competitors like Britain, Germany, they're not necessarily behind when it comes to inventive genius in electrical sciences. No, they're in a backward, backward condition because of the practical application to the industrial requirements of the nation. So they're identifying this diffusion deficit compared to the U.S. Would, so maybe there's still some leading sector people would say, look at steel production. Germany dominates steel production. The U.S. dominates steel production. Some other historians have gone back through and said those figures for crude steel output are misleading. Oftentimes what actually happened was Germany exported a lot of cheap steel. A lot of it was actually exported to Britain in which it was reprocessed to higher quality steel. So a lot of these numbers were misleading. And again, in the machine tool trajectory, that's where the US had this diffusion advantage in general purpose technologies. It's not about some special access to these technological secrets when it came to these machine tools. These have been around for 30, 40 years. People were making incremental improvements to these machine tools. I cite all these study committees in the 1850s, 1860s who are coming to the U.S. and figuring out what, trying to figure out what is happening. Why is the U.S. doing so well when it comes to machine intensity, such as um, this is the amount of installed horsepower uh, per factory, I believe. That, that's the metric. Why, why is the U.S. doubling Britain and Germany on this? It's about this eagerness in which they're, they're diffusing machinery across all branches of industry. And on this last dimension of the technological trajectories, it's more about this broad-based product growth and machine tools are this transmission center for all these different machine-using industries. Now, this maps onto differences in GPT skill infrastructure, the institutions for training and educating talent. And the US's ad advantage was its ability to broaden and systematize mechanical engineering skills. Britain just did not produce enough. That's pretty clear from the data based on measures of engineering density. Germany did produce enough, but they did not connect that talent with the industrial requirements of the nation. It wasn't practice oriented. Uh, the knowledge was not standardized in a way so that all these different application sectors could adopt interchangeable manufacturing. One piece of data on this these are from U.S. Bureau of Education reports from that time frame, which are translating the work by German scholars and engineering professors. And they're showing you here three representative ins German institutions and two representative U.S. institutions, MIT and Cornell, when it came to training engineer when it came to engineering schools in this period. Note the black, that's the amount of time devoted, instruction time devoted to practical, lab-based work, shot-based work. And there's a lot of German engineering literature from this time that's bemoaning the lack of practice-oriented mechanical engineering education. So let me do one more example from this period to bring home the point that the US is not this innovation superpower. Uh, it's not coming from the US's innovation capacity. When it came to chemicals, William Perkins is the British inventor of Mavine. Uh, Germany has all the best companies when it comes to industrial research on new chemicals. But even though the U.S. is so far from the scientific frontier, even though during this time period, we are sending our best and brightest to Germany to get their PhDs in, in chemicals um, to become chemists, the U.S. is better positioned to diffuse chemicals as this general purpose technology across all these different industries because the US is the birthplace of chemical engineering. Right? So that's the type of education and training that allows you to take these new chemicalization processes and apply it to food processing, uh, apply it to petroleum, apply it to all these different industries that require chemicalization. A few quotes and statistics that hammer home those points I just made. German universities dominate chemical research. They fail to create this unique combination that becomes the chemical engineering discipline. Nowhere is this more conspicuous where 
the country is far from the frontier of scientific research, but still dominates in the diffusion process. Okay. You know what they tell you about making slides. You just try to cram as much text as you can in a single slide. So I'm not, I'm not going to go through all the other historical case studies. There's also a chapter of statistical analysis that tries to confirm some of the points that I've made. But I will just put this up here just to give you a preview of how I do this for all the different cases. I basically ask the same questions, right? Identify the key technologies. I look at these three dimensions. Was the impact time frame, the phase of relative advantage, the breadth of growth, and then GPT scale infrastructure. And for the first industrial revolution, just as a preview, again, the interesting finding based off of looking at all these, uh, his, the work from historians, much of it more, more recent, um, Britain's advantages in these tweakers and these influencers, not in these expert scientists and engineers. Similar story in the third industrial revolution. This is an interesting case because there's no power transition. Everyone thinks that Japan is going to overtake the U.S. as the number one technological power, but it doesn't. But it didn't. So it's damaging for the leading sector account because all the parts of the leading sector mechanism are present. This is one of my favorite quotes in the entire project, right? They call back to this second industrial revolution example. German domination of chemical dye stuff helped propel that country to become this dominant industrial power. The parallels to Japanese strategy in electronics in the 1990s, in recent decades, are striking. So they're taking that leading sector template and saying, OK, look, Japan's going to become the number one technological power, but Japan does not overtake the US. Uh, and part of the reason is Japan does not lead the US when it comes to adoption of general purpose information and communications technology, like the computer and computerization. OK, let me wrap up and then turn it over to Richard. So implications for AI and the fourth industrial revolution. I would say the one sentence, the one line summary is both Chinese and US policymakers are preoccupied with the leading sector model. And they failed to learn the lessons from past industrial revolutions, which suggest a different pathway, the GPT diffusion model. Look at all these different texts, right? I'm sure many of you in the AI space are familiar with Kai-Fu Lee's AI superpowers book that informs Graham Allison, Eric Schmidt, Harvard Belfair professor, former CEO of Google, their report on how AI will impact uh, national security, that's all informing the National Security Commission on AI report, this huge congressional, uh, this huge body stood up by Congress to investigate the national security implications of AI. On the time frame point, it's this idea that China's going to overtake the U.S. based off advances in AI in the next decade, in this decade, in the 2020s, right? 10-year time frame, that's what they're operating under. GPT diffusion model suggests a much longer time frame. It's a marathon, not a sprint. By my, if, if we can apply this model to today, uh, we shouldn't see productivity payoffs, significant ones before 2030. Phase of advantage, right? These studies are really curious, really obsessed with can China outcompete the US when it comes to bringing new to the world innovations out? Uh, sort of cutting edge innovation. Well, if you look at the diffusion framework, actually China's not anywhere close to the US when it comes to uh, penetration rates, adoption rates of key digital technologies. The US is much better positioned to adopt and diffuse AI at scale. I can go over some of these indicators if people are interested in the Q&A, but I'll just put up this uh, table from a paper I published on China's diffusion deficit. Or if you look at the innovation capacity indicators, China ranks at around 13 in the world. But if you look at diffusion capacity indicators, China drops all the way to around 50th in the world. When it comes to breadth of growth, both China and the US are focused on enhancing their uh, capabilities in a few strategic industries. Uh, and actually, this is a research report from a think tank associated with China's cabinet-level body, the State Council, where they're saying 
let's get away from sort of focusing on picking winners in these narrow sectors. And let's try to support these economy-wide innovation efforts within a competitive market system because that's empirically been tied to faster diffusion and adoption. Beyond the general diffusion numbers, a few numbers that show you the US has the advantage in GPT skill infrastructure and AI. When it comes to engineering talent, most of the estimates that I cite in the book point to a two to one difference in terms of uh, producing AI practitioners. We're not talking about AI experts here. And then also how well does this engineering knowledge speak to the demands of industry? Are there good linkages between universities and industry? Are there good linkages between the people developing the technology and those implementing it? One indicator is the number of hybrid publications. We have one researcher, at least one researcher from industry and at least one researcher from university on the paper. U.S. leads the world with the highest number of those hybrid publications. China faces significant challenges in this space. I summarize a lot of this in this recent foreign affairs article where I say the U.S. is fixated, engrossed, obsessed, insert more thesaurus words here, in ensuring that cutting edge innovations do not lead to China. If you look at the current Biden administration's policy, I don't know how much time and energy, political capital, smart people's time is spent on this question. GPT diffusion theory suggests you should instead prioritize all these elements. And you might say they're not mutually exclusive. Go look at the Chips and Science Act and look at which planks have actually been implemented. The planks that are connected to specific companies, chip manufacturing, all those funds have been allocated. They're going out, they're being implemented. The planks that are trying to improve STEM workforce development, not as much attention, not as much political capital, not as much implementation on that front. It's just one small example. Okay, talk long enough. Here are a few things, a few minor takeaways, a few major takeaways uh, to leave you with. Better understanding of how and when emerging technologies affect economic power transitions, speaking to the general international relations literature direct implications for how we think about U.S.-China competition in AI. And I think more broadly, a way of trying to understand how do technologies affect international politics beyond just this topic of great power competition, right? When you're talking about the impact of technological change, there's not all technologies are created equal. So being able to tease out, here is the pattern of GPTs and how they interact with all these different institutional adaptations. You could do that if you're, if you're a student, you're a researcher in the space that's interested in looking at technology and other international outcomes. So there's the book uh, available everywhere you order your books. And uh, if you found this interesting, please do get a copy. So thanks for your time. Let me turn over the mic to Richard Danzig. Uh, Richard Danzig is a senior advisor at John Hopkins Applied Physics Lab, former secretary of the Navy. Uh, in 2008, he was the senior advisor to this person you may have heard of, uh, Barack Obama, uh, on national security issues. But what I admire most about Richard is uh, just his curiosity. It's, uh, I remember when we first met and you came to Oxford and talked to me about my dissertation, which was this topic, you asked, what is the book that has most influenced your thinking on this issue? And I told you David Edgerton's Shock of the Old. Edgerton is a historian of technology. And I think the next day you had set up a lunch at Imperial with David Edgerton to discuss uh, his work. So I think that's a testament to just this continued curiosity. I'm really looking forward to your comments. Do you want to just sit here? Sure, yeah. Okay. Um, thank you, Jeff. And I apologize for coming in um, after you'd started. Uh, I think it demonstrates that my own ability to diffuse myself through Washington is not very rapid. Um, uh, I want to uh, start just in the 10 minutes I've been allocated uh, by praising Jeff's work, and then I want to raise some questions about it and some of the difficulties in applying it. Um, the praise is, is really strong and genuinely motivated. Um, I, I think there are three things that uh, Jeff's work does in this book that uh, are just exceptional, but the combination of them is what's extraordinary. 
Um, one is the, the kind of talents of a, what I would think of as a mole, just digging deep into everything that he said and documented. And for those of you who heard this talk, you have some sense of it when you read the book or some of Jeff's other publications, that sense will be intensified. But I thought I'd just pluck out one example for you, which is from page 153 of Jeff's book, um, in which he offers what I think is a characteristic ding paragraph. Um, <laughs> bibliome bibliometric techniques can help substantiate the gap between the United States and Japan and skill infrastructure for software engineering. Okay, I got it, Jeff. Um, I analyzed around 7,000 publications from 1995, uh, and he goes on to say the, uh, further about how. According to my estimates, the United States boasted 1.59 universities per million people that met this baseline quality of software education, um, while Japan only had 1.17 universities per million people. Well, in Washington discourse to go through, to try and substantiate what is a small brick in the edifice that Jeff created, go through undoubtedly with the aid of AI, some 7,000 uh, publications to come up with a computation of the universities per million that's unique to this paragraph. Um, it's pretty, pretty remarkable and wonderful. That's combined second with, uh, if this was what I'm calling a mole-like thing, it's combined with a hawk-like um, willingness to stand back and look at the whole thing. And you get a sense of that obviously from the last half hour. Um, pretty amazing though to offer a general view that integrates the history of technology, general economic theory, political theory, notions about military, notions of what happened in different industrial revolutions and come up with a set of conclusions. And I think that's pretty terrific. Uh, th the third thing is that um, I, I think it, uh, 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 what comes to mind is a comment about Bronson Alcott, the father of Louisa May Alcott, the author of Little Women, a book that will probably not be cited in reviews of Jeff's work. Um, Bronson Alcott was an abolitionist and a philosopher, and it was said of Bronson Alcott that he soared into the infinite, fathomed the unfathomable, but never paid cash. And the reason the line appeals to me in this context is because I've suggested that in Jeff's mole-like and hawk-like ways, um, he really does fathom the unfathomable and soar into the infinite. Um, but what's also then really remarkable is that in the book, in chapter seven on artificial intelligence, he attempts to pay cash uh, to say, okay, here are the insights I've gathered and here's, I'm going to risk what I can say about what's happening now and I think will happen in the near term. And that's the part of this talk that relates to AI and China and military balance and the political balance and the economic balance of this competition. I think Jeff is completely right in his emphasis on assimilation and on tying it in the long term to the infrastructure, uh, including particularly the human capital that a society generates. And I think his propositions about uh, general uh, technologies uh, and how they diffuse or uh, make a compelling case against leading sector uh, kinds of thinking and just the way that he's laid out. And I think it's a huge contribution. Um, I have lots of trouble then uh, when we start to grapple with the actual case where we're paying cash AI in this context. The first difficulty is the military connection. Um, as Jeff put up from Paul Kennedy and others, there's a tendency to think, well, the military is a caboose on the train of the engine of progress and the engine of progress is technological and the like. Um, and the, over the long term, I think that's true, measured in decades. But if you measure it in single digit years, I have serious doubts. I think it's entirely possible for that car to run rather separately and for the engine to look different. And that raises a number of questions. Well, first is uh, straightforwardly, um, what does diffusion to the military look like as diffusion through the society as a whole? And there's a vast literature on this subject. 
but it's clear that you could, uh, the military is idiosyncratic. You can think of it, if you will, as one of those leading sectors. And if the Germans can generate, as Jeff points out, leadership in die stuffs, even when they don't lead in diffusion in other ways, you can run the logic in the opposite direction here and say, if the military is a leading sector, maybe in the short term, an enterprise can generate, a nation can generate military power quite apart from their general diffusive capability. You also, I think, would be very interested, for example, in predicting AI in the ways in which the military sector is either advantaged or disadvantaged, and particularly in the US and China in that dimension. What does that look like? I think there are a lot of things that inhibit that diffusion that are extremely interesting. Clay Christensen's work, Innovator's Dilemma, is classic, 1996, as I recollect, that lays out the problems for established capital-intensive organizations to change what they're doing. So if you read Jeff, your view might reasonably be, I don't really care, because when we get to the 2030 or 2040 kind of period of time, the larger phenomena that Jeff describes will outweigh that. Well, Jeff is considerably younger than me and has more assurance that he's going to be here in 2030 and 2040. <laughs> Maybe for other reasons, I care a lot about what does it look like in 2027 when China says it wants to invade Taiwan or 2030 or some such. Um, and I think that picture is quite different and we should not be so casual about treating the military as a caboose on the train. Then when you come to AI as a specific technology, I think there are a number of questions that also arise. Um, one is Jeff's work, I think quite rightly, questions the value of being a first mover and it's connected to the emphasis on R&D and the like. And in general, over the longer term, I think he's right, but here comes that same clause over the longer term. Um, I think you have to ask whether AI potentially generates an extraordinary first mover advantage that looks quite different in these contexts. Um, and here I'd point you, if you've not already seen it, to the work uh, that was published 90 days ago by Leopold Aschenbrenner online. It's a 150 page text and doesn't have Jeff's conciseness of writing. Um, but it lays out a view in this uh, mono, monograph called Situational Awareness that says, hey, within three, four years, we'll be able to do extraordinary things with AI. And very quickly, it will generate a first mover advantage that will change the world. Well, I've had some exchanges with Ashen Brenner and uh, with some other people working on this. Um, and my view is there's lots here I disagree with, but this isn't the topic of the moment. I won't spend a lot of time on it. But a point that I do focus on that I think is a relevant test case for you, Jeff, is I think it is the case that AI put aside whether it will generate this uh, artificial general intelligence, the superhuman ability to do what human beings do, but faster and better. I think it is able clearly to do one thing that human beings do quite particularly, and that is to create uh, computer code and to analyze it. And uh, that means that if in fact the prophets who believe in AI coming quickly are correct, maybe in three, four, five years, we'll have the ability from an artificial intelligence to have the equivalent of a million programmers at our beck and call. And those programmers will be talented and they'll work 24 hours a day. Well, I suspect Jeff works 24 hours a day, but most programmers do not. Uh, so this is an extraordinary power when you think about how dependent the world is on computers and how dependent military systems are. If I have the ability to have a million programmers instantaneously at my beck and call, I can find vulnerabilities in, for example, the systems of communication and control that undergird all modern militaries and I can destabilize the world in many important ways, including the degree to which nuclear systems are dependent on those. So maybe AI is different, and we all hesitate to say anything is really different, but um, I look at 
the good historical work you've done on first mover advantage and wonder if maybe I ought to recognize that this is a different circumstance and that from a military standpoint and actually from an economic one, give me a million programmers like that. Don't you think I can control many financial markets and manipulate them? And how about political stuff? You know, there's a lot of talk about misinformation, but if I have a million programmers, I can collect your digital dust. And I don't want to be pretentious about you, but somebody else can collect my digital dust and manipulate me very easily um, because they know exactly how to pitch to me and how to present information and misinformation in those ways. So lastly, um, as a different aspect of the AI uh, activity, um, you get to Jeff's proposition about how you need, uh, in effect, I'll, I'll be, use a loose phrase, a million workers out there who are trained by quality institutions and on the job training to innovate and they carry forward the general purpose technology, the GPT, so as to diffuse it within society as a whole. But is it possible that AI is different because its rate of diffusion is different? In fact, we know that if you look at the cell phone, for example, it's the fastest diffusing invention in the, in the history of the world, and that the rate of diffusion is accelerating. And if you look at chat GPT-4, the leading example of AI at the moment out there, its rate of diffusion is an order of magnitude faster than the cell phone was. And it's in part because the technology is designed to be used by people who don't know a lot. It's designed to be used by people like me who have a kind of layman's interaction with it. But it's also in part because the system itself is self-generating and it generates intellectual product, if you will. It generates computer code. It can program itself and generate. So does that change then the number of people I need out there to be diffusers? And is the technology itself self-diffusing in a manner? And if you think that, then what you find is that we're in a very different world than the world that Jeff has so well analyzed. So what I would suggest in conclusion is, this is an extraordinary piece of analysis based on the evidence that has been presented by the prior cases, and I admire it hugely. One of the consequences of the, the wonderful attribute of being willing to pay cash is that you have to come to grips with the present and the future. And when I try and use the material that Jeff has generated for me, what I'm struck are Yes, the continuities, but also the discontinuities, and especially the discontinuities in the short term. It may be that the Ding world comes to materialize over the longer term, and those are the right longer term bets. But in the nearer term, and I don't just mean this week, I mean the next single digit number of years, we may be looking at something very different. So the fact that I raise these questions is a tribute to the work that that Professor Ding has done. Um, I think it's a, a terrific collection of issues and insights. I think the insights are fundamentally sound in the emphasis on building human capital, on the emphasis on general purpose technologies rather than leading sector and the like. But I do think you need to treat the military as itself a leading sector and not something that mixes into the general even though it also mixes into the general. And beyond that, I think we need to recognize that maybe the past isn't quite such a good indicator of the future. Um, I think I'll stop there. Thank you. So maybe I'll take a few minutes to respond um, and then we'll open it up to general Q and A. Um, so yeah, thank you, Richard, for these really insightful comments. I'm going to put the line fathoming the unfathomable in my LinkedIn bio after this talk. <laughs> uh, let me start with this really nice illustration of is the military a caboose or is it its own leading sector? I think for the purposes of this book, I am operating in that Kennedy chain where 
it's about economic power first. It's the most fungible type of power. We've seen historically that comes first. Sustained economic power eventually translates to military and geopolitical influence. I do think you're right, though, um, that the military is not just a caboose. A, a lot of people see military development and military investment in the early cycles of the general purpose technology as well. Uh, so that's another way the military interacts with this GPT story is the military acts as this huge source of public procurement demand, and that sort of creates this anchor for general purpose technologies to develop. I will say on this military point that for me, the way that GPTs impact military power may very well be very much along this GPT diffusion path. Like, I think we have this idea that one day uh, DeepMind is going to open a box, we're going to get AGI, and that's going to be a super weapon, and uh, whichever country opens up that box first is going to be the military superpower, and anybody who's a few seconds behind is going to lose out. And it brings me back to research I've done on how did electricity affect military innovation. Back then, if you read all the presses and the trade presses and the technical journals, everyone thought that countries were going to develop these electric rays of mass destruction that sweep entire battlefields away. What ended up happening? Electricity's impact on military affairs was very much like this diffusion, GPT diffusion pathway. It took a really long time. Each application sector had to make their own complementary changes. Uh, coastal defenses had to do something different. The signaling branches had to do something different. The military very much relied on the civilian engineering uh, talent base to adopt electricity. And it was much more diffuse. And I think that is how AI will impact uh, military power as well. And of course, that leads into your second set of points, which is, is AI different? Um, I think what I'll say here is, the book can't do everything. What this book does is says, if the lessons of history do hold, here's how they would apply to the AI case. I think my starting point is a little bit different. I think most people, when they study AI and international politics, when they pontificate on it, when they make policy on it, they do so in a vacuum. They think AI is different. I think that's the baseline for most people in this city, that AI is something different. And so the it's really just like, Okay, we have all those voices. We have all this, these ideas around this side of the scale. And I would point that to be like the inside view, right? I think uh, Kahneman and people would say there's this inside view. It's like you're really in depth on all the new technical trends of AI. You're looking at the profits that Microsoft is generating with uh, ChatGPT. You're really projecting on these specific technological trends. And we're underweighted on the external view, which is. What are the closest historical comparisons for AI? What lessons can we learn from that? And what if we don't just study and talk about AI in a vacuum? And what if we actually use historical data to think about it? I'll just say one thing on the three to four year timeline and this idea of a million programmers. So I started, we started talking about this topic in 2017, which feels like a lifetime ago when you calculate it in terms of AI years. I remember then people were saying in three to four years, we'll get, <laughs> we'll get sort of this supercharged AI capabilities. And I imagine three to four years from now, we'll get more people saying in three to four years, we'll get this super um, AI capability, just like how fusion energy is always 10 years away. So I think if we were having this conversation in the advent of computers, you could almost say, you could sketch things in very similar timelines, right? Computers are going to diffuse faster. They're going to impact productivity faster. Uh, they're going to create this army of engineers and programmers. It's going to be all these digital humans, and uh, we're going to solve productivity growth. But Solo's famous paradox is we see the computers everywhere except in the productivity statistics. And it took a really long time, even for information and communications technologies, to eventually find their way into uh, economic applications. Uh, but all these points are really well taken, I think, they're excellent starting points for like future. If can I just squeeze in uh, just a couple of quick things, and then uh, I'm sure we want to open up. They may help the conversation. Uh, first, it's very useful insofar as in the broader conversation we talk about artificial intelligence, not to talk about 
artificial general intelligence is there's two abstracts. So it's useful, I think, to stick with the example of the million programmers. Um, second, I, I definitely take your point on the analogy of electricity and the tendency not to think historically. And yes, good for you for adding that. But I do think then you have to ask yourself, what are the differences as well as the similarities? And one way of putting that point is, if you mastered electricity, how would you use it to prevent your opponent from uh, developing a military capability that was extremely powerful? I don't think it lends itself to that. Give me a million programmers, and I think I can thwart my near competitor in doing it. And the third thing is on the rate of innovation, and this is the last point, as you appreciate, yes, it was slow, and Solo's comment is a great one from the mid-1980s, but it's only slow compared to the cell phone that came later, et cetera. It's not slow historically compared to electricity. It's a blink of an eye compared to other uh, technologies. What we're seeing is an acceleration of the pace of introduction and, and of assimilation, and to use your word, diffusion. But I'll stop with that. Yeah, we should stop this from becoming a podcast and bring in uh, <laughs> bring in the commentators. Thank you, though. Uh, let's go with Mike, and then we'll come this way. Yeah, my comments are a less eloquent version of Richard's. Um, I, I hope and expect that this book is an award-winning book as um, an insightful analysis of the industrial revolutions of the last 250 years. But like Richard, I have some reservations about its predictive capacity for the next 25 years. And you know, part of it has to do with what Richard said in terms of looking at the military decisive strategic advantage super weapon scenario. And, and things are moving very fast. I mean, I remember when Dick Postrom's book came out on super intelligence about a decade ago, most of the surveys of the AI community in the mid late 2010s were talking about AGI or super intelligence and, and making estimates that it would be some decades away, maybe the middle part of the century, maybe the second half of the century. And my sense is that the AI community sees things moving much faster now than before. It's in part because at some point, AI might not be just self-diffusing, which I think is a terrific insight, but also self-advancing. And, and, and I think this is where some of the parallels between the previous industrial revolutions and this revolution are different. I mean, there's, there's a big difference, I think, between revolutions that really depended on massive amounts of hardware. There's a big difference between dye stuffs and brain stuffs. And it's possible that you know, a super weapon scenario will develop, maybe not. And so just to wrap up, I think as a policy matter, you know, my advice to folks in this town would be you know, go all in on both tracks, go in on innovation and diffusion, doing the things that you're recommending, but, uh, and, and that is being neglected. Uh, and if we do end up in a more normal scenario where a more traditional pattern of diffusion is really decisive, well, then we do want to be prepared for that. And I think you're making really important observations about how we have not put enough emphasis on that. But I think we also have to be mindful of the other scenario, which is that things that could happen in the next five to 10 years would make the longer term scenario irrelevant. Yeah, I think uh, I won't repeat most of my points, but thank you, Mike. I think it, I think it's a good point, um, especially highlighting the self diffusing point. And I think you're right that you can go all in on both tracks. I think practically speaking, uh, it's hard to go all in on both tracks. I think we've seen that with the Chips and Science Act. I talked to a lot of people in the Department of Commerce, in the NSC, reporters who talk with the high level principals in all these areas. I would say 99.9% .9 of my conversations are about this leading sector model. That's just what, that, that's just what is happening. Um, so, and I think there are instances where they directly clash with each other. Uh, visa restrictions on Chinese students to study sensitive issues uh, and restricting us from widening our talent base in AI. That might be good from a leading sector perspective, not so good from a GPT diffusion perspective. One of our key advantages in competition with Japan 
was we were able to essentially import all this foreign talent and Japan wasn't. So those would be the two points. In practice, in theory, yes, go all in on both tracks. In practice, that's, that's not what happens in the city. Um, and number two, they do sometimes directly conflict. Now let's go Nick and then uh, let's take two at a time. And uh, Christine, are there comments from the Zoom as yep. well that we want to get to yes. at some point? Okay, go two at a time here. Okay. Yeah. All right, Nick Von Artus from uh, the Elliot School and Department of Economics here. So, Jeff, uh, I congratulate you on the book. This is great stuff. I buy the story of diffusion and general purpose technology. I have two sources that uh, really defined my thinking on the, this particular topic, and one is Rosenberg and Birdswell's book, 1986, about how the West grew rich how essentially in the 16th, 17th century, 15th perhaps, uh, Europe overthrew China. That was the big candidate for the Industrial Revolution. Right? And Nelson's and Wright's uh, paper in 1992, worrying about uh, the US losing its advantage uh, to Japan in that, in that case. Right? In both of those, what the, the, the message that I get is that actually a technocratic um, uh, um, approach to this to this issue doesn't 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 tell the whole story. Really, what, what happens it seems is that the countries that uh, take the lead uh, change their entire innovation system. You mentioned something about the U.S. Um, in the Second Industrial Revolution, being able to educate more practitioners. Um, yeah. It did so because it invented business schools, electrical engineering departments, mechanical engineering departments, and all the engineering kind of uh, use that the Europeans actually shun away as non-scientific. It was non-scientific to do this for the Europeans, right? So, so here I see the story, which is very correct. But what I would like to see a little bit more from your side is why this diffusion of JPTs uh, uh, happens the way it does. Right? Um, because that's really what's, the, uh, in my mind, the, the story for the policy decision-making. Policy decision-making is interested in the fundamental conditions that will make this spread of this JPT very, very efficient, right? very, very good. And, and I would like you um, to explain this a little bit more than I see in the book. Thank you. Um, I'll try to be brief. <laughs> I started seeing I could help you fill the book up and make it better. Um, having lived for past years, but um, there's a danger with AI still of the old garbage in, garbage out. Um, and if it's intelligence with China and they force their people to repeat our mistakes, in industrialization instead of learning from them. Um, and you also have Z change the Ten Commandments, where it, he's altering things, so there has to be a, we're running into, he, is he changing the root definitions of what we have lived by, the opera, the, is it authoritarian? Must socialism lose if it's intelligence? Because people want the human freedom. Uh, but I, yeah. I see you left out Eli Whitney. Um, so you're talking about the cotton, uh, the, the, all yeah. that, but that's another part of this. I can tell you more about the 91 that have Jeff Dees got stopped when the news broke. They wanted to buy Rockefeller Center and IBM. There were changes there, uh, but major shifts happened then that curved where America was going to accept the Chinese and the Japanese model. And that right. fits into politics. Yeah, great. Uh, so, so Nick, to your point, yeah, I think you spot on the management there's like sort of like some management revolution in the u.s at this time business schools mechanical engineering electric departments electrical engineering departments i think why do we see this regular patterns of gpts diffusing and why does this trajectory happen the way it does i think it goes back to these criteria for gpts these three criteria um there's sort of this scope for continual improvement it's this new technology that has to consistently incrementally be advanced it only makes its mark by widespread diffusion across pervasive, like the economy in a pervasive way. And it requires these structural changes that require like uh, complementary innovations in all these other sectors. So then 
the, the, when I talked a little bit about the requirement for all this coordination between the GPT and, and so many countless application sectors, you don't want there to be like one sector's thinking the GPT is going this way. Uh, so they're making all these complementary in innovations to match this direction, but actually the GPT is going this way. Uh, so something about having this strong engineering discipline that can systemize the spread of best practices, standards, and technical standards in GPT can, can help you diffuse and adopt it better. Uh, but that, that's a little bit behind the mechanics. A uh, gentleman up front here, yeah, I think this idea of how does regime type affect the adoption of these new technologies is really important. When I tackle this in the second to last chapter, and, and I say that um, actually this top-down centralized approach of China is, is not that well equipped to, to diffuse general purpose technologies like AI at scale. Let me take some in that direction. So here uh, in the back and then uh, two over here. So let's take three at a time. Oh, it's Shana. <laughs> Uh, I'm Joelle, his wife's friend, and Jimmy's on <laughs> I would recommend that if you have the book, it's useful to show it when you ask the question, but wave it in the, in the air when you want to be recognized to be answered. <laughs> yeah, you only get called on. <laughs> um, um, so I studied sociology, so I'm like coming at this from a different angle, and thinking about you talking about economic efficiency speaks to loss of jobs. Right, and the individual implication. And so my question is more about how do you, especially as you see industrial revolution history have created these waves of populism and fear and all that. So how do you get people to align with the GPT model from an individual perspective if you see the lack of trust in government or other systems at play that make it harder for people to trust that this is the right way to do if they're losing their job? Here and then here. Hi, Jeff. I'm Kevin Allison. I'm the CEO of Minerva Technology Policy Advisors. And I was really interested to hear you start to unpack a little bit about policy implications. So you mentioned CHIPS and Science Act, that we're not funding the and science part as much as we're funding the CHIPS part. Uh, I'm just curious, what, what other kind of high-level policy implications can we draw out of your thesis? If, you're, if your thesis is right, um, where, where are we getting policy wrong, and where should we be making changes? Uh, hi, Lewis Shepard, uh, CTO of Broadcom, Silicon Valley Company. And a long time subscriber to your newsletter, so uh, great to be here. Thanks. I uh, really look forward to reading it. Uh, I'm just curious if you were aware of the book, uh, it sort of sounds uh, similarly spirited uh, from I don't know, 15 years ago, uh, Ben Peters, How Not to Network a Nation. Similar argument on uh, the invention of the internet how not to network a nation, and it looks at the contrasting Soviet experience in the 50s, 60s, and their attempt to uh, create, uh, I mean, exactly what we would have described as what Jane Harbin had of the internet. Different uh, differential geopolitical uh, reasons, but to your point of your next last article on the chief difference, uh, that's why he says they fail. And so it's a fascinating, similarly digital um, uh, argument, and he doesn't use the same theoretical model, but he would, I think, very much resonate with the GPT diffusion uh, explanation. Great. Yeah, thank you for those. Let me take those. I'll answer them. And then maybe, Christine, we conclude with two questions from the Zoom just to make folks there feel included as well. OK, so Shana, thank you for coming. I think it's a great question, right? This idea of I'm talking all about economic productivity but we don't just care about productivity, we care about people losing their jobs and, and especially displacement um, of jobs. Uh, so I, I think one way to connect those two points is if you get all this backlash to AI displacing people's jobs and it's not integrated properly, uh, then people lose trust in AI and actually that slows the adoption of AI. In a, in a, so if we're talking in 40, 50, you know, 30 to 40 year timelines, then prop addressing some of these concerns is really important to have sustained adoption of AI. Kevin, some of the policy implications are highlighted here. Uh, so policies directed at broadening the talent pool, such as providing community colleges with greater backing to train 
an AI savvy workforce. I say fully implementing the Chips of Science Act. And then I give a few other examples of uh, technology diffusion institutions. Uh, some of those can be tweaked by like federal levers, but actually a lot of that work is happening in at the state level too. So like the manufacturing extension partnership, uh, those are examples of like, uh, you know, extension uh, partnerships, field offices. Uh, there's other programs that other countries have developed, such as like a voucher system that encourages small and medium sized businesses to interact with frontier firms and adopt technology. So those, th if you read the full article, there'll be a list there as well. And Louis, good to uh, finally meet you after uh, engaging with you on the newsletter. I I'll definitely check out the book. And I think your articulation of the Soviet experience is very similar to the diffusion deficit article where I go into why the Soviet Union was good at innovation but not at diffusion. We get two questions. Yeah, well, I think that um, all but one have already been answered. Okay. Um, but there's the hidden question. Um, how do you see the general nature of intelligence and the existing integration of providers like Microsoft and Google affecting the rate of AI adoption? Yeah, I think this is a really interesting question, especially when you look at the US Japan case. There was this portmanteau called Wintelism, this idea that this combination of Windows and Intel as the key standard setters in technology, did that give the US some sort of advantage when it came to the diffusion of computerization, adoption of computerization at scale? I think there's interesting parallels to, okay, does this dominance of NVIDIA and OpenAI, this sort of, again, the, this, this, these two standard setters in AI, does it give the US an advantage? I think. It's still up in the air because there's a lot of literature that says more competitive markets are actually better for diffusion. And so having these two giants that dominate everything might actually slow the diffusion process for the US. I, I think this is an area that I really like to look at future research into. So that's a good question. Awesome. Well, thank you all for being here. Um, and thank you as well. For